This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, we continue to look at Amazon and corporate welfare as New York and Virginia agree to give Amazon over $3 billion in tax breaks to build new office complexes in, uh, in uh, New York and near Washington, D.C. According to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos' net worth on January 1 was $99 billion. On May 1st, it was $132 billion, meaning it rose $33 billion in just a few months. If you divide that difference by the 120 days of that period, you'll find that he made $275 million per day. Divide that by 24 hours in a day to get about $11.5 million per hour, the equivalent of roughly $191,000 per minute or the clincher, $3,182 every second. That, according to Bloomberg. And you compare that to the median Amazon employee salary, $28,000. Jeff Bezos makes more than that, Time magazine reports, in 10 seconds. We're expanding our conversation. Joining us from Washington, D.C., is Greg Leroy, executive director of Good Jobs First, which has closely tracked public subsidies given to Amazon. In Portland, Maine, we're joined by Stacey Mitchell, co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, directs its Community Scaled Economy Initiative. She's the author of Big Box Swindle, The True Cost of Mega Retailers and the Fight for America's Independent Business. Earlier this year, Mitchell wrote a cover story for The Nation titled, Amazon Doesn't Just Want to Dominate the Market. It wants to become the market. And still with us here in New York is Assemblymember Ron Kim, who's introducing legislation to block the Amazon deal and redirect taxpayer money away from Amazon subsidies and toward student debt relief. Let's begin this segment with Greg Leroy. Your response to the deal and your concerns. Well, I support everything that the assemblyman just said is in his concerns. Look, we know that the price tag of the incentives alone in New York City is well over $2.8 billion. There's some people, parts of it we can't even put a price tag on yet. Um, a lot of it's automatic and should have been capped. It's way too big for a single project. We know that there's unreported subsidies in the Virginia end of the deal as well, so that the total packages together exceed $4.6 billion. Amazon is clearly, in the way it worded its own press statement, trying to downplay and kind of play a shell game with the numbers and hide some of these bigger numbers that are coming from New York. Um, and look, everybody knows that the Long Island City is very hot real estate. It's another example of Amazon getting paid to do what it would have done anyway. It wanted to be in the financial capital of the world, of the, of the country, and the political capital of the country. Um, so no surprises about its location. Uh, and we're, we're massively subsidizing, yet again, a company to do what it wants to do anyway. Uh, Stacey Mitchell, I'd like to ask you about this whole issue of job creation, because uh, the politicians are always touting that it's important to put, uh, put out these subsidies to be able to create jobs. But one of the unwritten stories I think that you've been tracking is the job destruction, uh, and especially of small businesses, that Amazon represents as it continues to grow uh, in our economy. Yeah, I mean, Amazon is really concentrating a lot of economic power. And as it does that, it's pushing other businesses out. We've lost about 85,000 independent small retailers in the last 10 years. We're seeing small and mid-sized manufacturers getting squeezed, laying off staff, and disappearing, because Amazon increasingly is the gatekeeper to consumers. It increasingly picks winners and losers, and it uses that power uh, to push others out of the marketplace and to gain more power for itself. And as it does that, it's actually, as you noted, eliminating far more jobs than it's creating. I mean, Amazon is a highly efficient, highly automated company, and so it's eliminating a lot of retail jobs. Uh, our calculations suggest that we're losing about two uh, retail jobs for every one job created in an Amazon warehouse. But the picture for working people is even worse than that because um, you know, pathways to the middle class, being able to start your own business, to have a diverse economy with lots of different opportunities, um, that's really disappearing. And we think that, you know, one of the reasons that wages have not been growing uh, really at all uh, has to do with concentrated power and the fact that we no longer have that kind of dynamism in the economy. And also, uh 
Amazon, much like Uber, uh, has a has a business model, a long term business model of capturing the market, but then increasingly uh, relying on robots to do its work, so that eventually the labor force will be reduced. Uh, uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, that's right. I mean, Amazon's warehouses have become increasingly automated. Um, they haven't figured out yet quite how to do everything that humans can do. Um, but, you know, it's, it's safe to say that really uh, humans are, are literally cogs in the machine in an Amazon warehouse. These are highly automated. Humans fulfill the roles that only they can fulfill. But over time, we've seen Amazon's employment numbers relative to its sales actually decline. And that's a measure of this increasing automation. Uh, and we expect that, you know, fairly soon Amazon will begin to have robots that can do the things that only uh, humans can do. Uh, but again, I think you know the the jobs inside Amazon. Um, you know these are are jobs maybe that we shouldn't. Uh, you know they're, they're hard jobs. They're not necessarily jobs that we want to preserve. I think the bigger problem from a job standpoint is that when you have a company that has a stranglehold on the economy. I mean, normally if you go back in time. We've had technological progress um, that has at times wiped out entire sectors, entire areas of, uh, of employment. And that's OK if you have an economy that's dynamic, where you have new businesses coming along, new industries, new creations. But what we're seeing because of Amazon's market power is that we're not getting those new businesses. We're not getting those new industries coming along and creating new jobs. And that's the real problem. On Tuesday, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio applauded the Amazon decision. We're going to have an opportunity here for tens of thousands of New Yorkers, everyday New Yorkers, kids who come up through our public schools, kids who go to our uh, community colleges and our four-year colleges, to have opportunity at Amazon. And not just at Amazon, but we know that Amazon's presence is going to help to build the entire tech sector. In this city now, that tech ecosystem is about 350,000 jobs, just got a huge boost uh, from Amazon's decision to come here. But we know that's only going to spark a lot more growth. We see a future where that tech community could be a half million jobs or more. So, New York State Assembly member Ron Kim, if you could respond to the mayor and also this Business Insider report. Uh, Amazon's going to be placed in Long Island City in Queens. Long Island City real estate brokers told The Wall Street Journal they had witnessed a flurry of inquiries over the past week. Some of these people were even buying units sight unseen via text message. The journal wrote in, on Tuesday morning, this is the first time in my 20-year career that I have seen the market go from a buyer's market to a seller's market overnight based on a rumor, said Patrick Smith, a stribbling agent in New York City, a real estate agent. So if you could respond to both this, what de Blasio is saying, a massive growth in the tech sector and jobs, good jobs for New York's kids and students and people in this in the city, and what's going to happen to real estate? I think this is a great example of a misguided technocratic Democrat who is hiding behind big tech and pushing out the narrative to the public that the big tech will solve every single problem uh, in our communities and, and to humankind. That is not the case. This is a clear example of how big tech artificially raises value. This isn't real value. As Stacey has said, real value comes from innovation, creativity, small business, local economies, circulation of wealth at the, at the very bottom of our economies. That's not happening. Amazon, Uber, you name it all, this is all based on an extraction economy. They're designed to extract as much money and value out of our communities, and this, it's not going to add um, to sustainable job growth or economic growth. Uh, Greg Leroy, I'd like to ask you, in terms of the, the trend nationwide, in terms of these uh, government subsidies for uh, job creation, uh, the, obviously the Foxconn uh, example in Wisconsin was, is, is another one. Could you talk about what these governments, local governments, are doing and what they're getting in return for these subsidies? I'd be glad to. And I just want to footnote something on the de Blasio quote there. You know, we know that about four out of five, typically, of the new job takers at a project like this will not be current residents of New York or Arlington. They will be people moving to the area from outside somewhere. And that means a lot of growth getting induced, a lot of schools having to be expanded and infrastructure built and public services provided. Guess who's going to get stuck with that tax bill if Amazon's not paying to help cover the cost of that induced growth? This whole issue of what we call persistent mega deals—that is, these 
you know, nine-figure, ten-figure subsidy packages, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars for individual transactions, whether it's HQ2 or Foxconn or data centers of, like Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook. Um, it's, it's a crazy dynamic. You know, there's a long history in America of a very corporate-dominated site location system. It's actually about 80 years old and was born in New York City with a company called Fantas Factory Locating Service in the late 1930s. Um, today, we have even a president who has endorsed this race to the bottom, this war among the states, so-called, by sponsoring and assisting Terry Gow, the chairman of Foxconn, when he parlayed that auction last year, whipsawing a bunch of states against each other for the big subsidy package in Wisconsin. That Foxconn package now is really melting down. I mean, it was valued at about $3 billion from the state to begin with. It's now north of $4.7 billion, because there's been a ton of local and infrastructure aid put on top of it. And now we're getting different product lines, high degrees of automation, rumors of uh, reports in The Wall Street Journal of Chinese engineers having to be brought in uh, because they are having trouble recruiting sufficient white-collar workforce. Um, you know, it's no secret that Governor Walker, put out by the uh, voters last week, had stopped touting that deal uh, on the merits, because it was melting down so badly. And jobs uh, dropping from 13,000 to something like 3,000. Correct. Yeah, the, the cost per job keeps going up, because that denominator keeps shrinking. It's the great disappearing deal of all time. And, Greg Leroy, I wanted to ask you about the Virginia aspect of this deal. And the uh, what's often overlooked is the amount of business that Amazon does with government agencies, defense contractors, and its cloud business, and what the, its decision to locate in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., uh, will mean. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. A lot of people don't realize that Amazon has historically made very few profits, and only recently any profits at all, on its retail business. Most of the profits, in, including all of the profits for some years, come from its cloud computing services, from Amazon Web Services. It's the biggest cloud computing company in the world. It has uh, roughly a 40 percent market share. And among its most lucrative clients in that space are the Pentagon and the Central Intelligence Agency and other federal agencies. And as Stacey and others have pointed out recently, Amazon is now pushing very aggressively to gain more control over federal procurement lines and also state and local government procurement lines. So this footprint, people don't notice, but this Crystal City footprint that they have now said is going to be one of the HQ2s is very close, literally a, practically a stone's throw from the Pentagon. Democratic uh, Congress member-elect Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tweeted, "'Displacement is not community development. Investing in luxury condos is not the same thing as investing in people and families. Shuffling working-class people out of a community does not improve their quality of life.'" Um, I wanted to ask Assemblymember Rich—I wanted to ask Assemblymember Kim um, about the progressive letter you referred to, this was the former um, city council speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, Idanis Rodriguez, Jumani Williams, Nadia Velasquez, a congress member, um, all progressive leaders, um, who signed on to the letter asking Amazon to come to New York. So what is progressive about this deal? Well, I think many of my colleagues ha are regretting that they signed the letter. They didn't know what they're signing on to. Uh, so I want to make sure, I want to be clear that many of them are, sign are saying now that they no longer have signed, they're no longer willing to sign on and uh, keep their name to the letter. Um, there's nothing progressive about Amazon coming to New York. Um, this is uh, a corporate giveaway to the richest man on this planet. Um, there's, and we need to make sure that we can go back uh, and claw back the agreement to make sure that the taxpayers go where it's desperately needed to the working uh, and middle class families who are living uh, with so much debt in the city of New York. I wanted to put a question to Stacey Mitchell in Portland, Maine. In the piece you write for The Nation, the subtitle is, The company is a radically new kind of monopoly with ambitions that dwarf those of earlier empires. Explain. That's right. You know, I think Amazon is so dominant in so many areas. It's now capturing one out of every two dollars that Americans spend online. As Greg noted, it controls the underlying infrastructure for a lot of the Internet, you know, over 40 percent of the world's cloud computing capacity. Um, it's increasingly moving into shipping and package delivery. It's taking on UPS and the Postal Service. 
Uh, it has the largest market share in home voice systems through Alexa, uh, and on and on it goes. But I think rather than think about Amazon as being dominant in any of these markets, the way to understand what this company is all about is that Amazon is, is about controlling the essential infrastructure that other companies need to use in order to reach the market. Its online platform, more than half of all product searches online now start at Amazon's, where, uh, Amazon's website. And what that means is that if you're any company producing or retailing anything, uh, increasingly, if you want to be able to reach consumers, you have to become a seller on Amazon's platform. And what that means is that Amazon now controls your business. They have the ability to gather data on what you're doing, to use that data to, com to uh, compete against you. Uh, they can levy a kind of tax on your trade. They can demote you in the search results. They can retaliate against you if you complain. I mean, essentially what has happened is that Amazon is privatizing the market, if you will. In a democracy, uh, a market should be an open place where uh, the rules are set by, by the public, that there are public rules that govern the buying and selling of goods and how we're going to structure our markets. But what Amazon is moving us toward is a situation in which commerce occurs in a private arena, and Amazon sets the terms of trade. It basically creates the rules and regulations by which other companies and other participants are allowed to operate. And I think in light of that, it's no surprise that Amazon is expanding its presence in Washington, D.C., because you know, we have um, antitrust laws that are designed to um, put a check on this kind of concentrated economic power. I think Jeff Bezos very clearly sees that as the as the really the only threat to his future growth. And so cozying up to federal government is part of his strategy. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Greg Leroy on, on this. Uh the, the whole issue of, of whether Amazon needed to be courted and provided all these subsidies to relocate uh, to the uh, to New York City or, or the reality is that because of the model that they've created of delivering products uh, the same day in some cases uh, to people around the country, they need to be in certain places, especially in population centers. My students at Rutgers University did a whole uh, a series of articles about the 10 Amazon warehouses that had developed in central New Jersey to serve the Philadelphia and New York City markets. 15,000 jobs were created virtually with no subsidies, uh, so that they actually need to be in certain spots. And the politicians perhaps had more leverage uh, than they themselves understand. You're right, exactly, Juan. In fact, we've been—long before the HQ2 auction came out, we had been publishing about all the subsidies being given to the warehouses, making this very point. If you look at the history of the company, in the early years, they grew their market share by having the price advantage of not collecting sales tax. And they were legally able to avoid that by avoiding what's called nexus, that is, a sufficient physical presence in a state so that the state could compel the collection of sales taxes. They had a small number of warehouses in states without sales tax into which they shipped into the other states that do have sales taxes. But over time, with the prime business model evolving to rapid delivery, two day, one day, same day, it, it was inevitable that they would have to locate lots of warehouses close to all the zip codes with lots of prime household members. And so they started caving on this issue back in 2011, 2012, sometimes under pressure from states who found that they were skirting the law and actually locating in states without collecting sales tax ahead of time. Um, so, over time, they had to do that, and yet they still got paid. They discovered that they could create jobs, even though, as Stacy pointed out, they're actually creating one job at the expense of two others, as bricks-and-mortar retailers continue to melt down and companies like Sears, as the latest example, go bankrupt, um, getting paid to do what they want. We said publicly to public officials, Amazon should pay to arrive, not vice versa. And I would say the same thing about HQ2. If Amazon's going to come and price a bunch of people out of a city and create a bunch of new expenses by inducing so much growth, they should pay to arrive rather than get paid to. We didn't even get to labor conditions, but in September, we spoke to James Bloodworth, a U.K.-based journalist, author of Hired Six Months Undercover in Low-Wage Britain. While undercover at an Amazon fulfillment warehouse, he found workers toiling amidst abusive conditions, no bathroom breaks. This is Bloodworth describing working in an Amazon warehouse. Uh, if, you, if you took a day off sick, you were given a disciplinary for that. And if you received six of these disciplinaries, you would effectively lose your job. 
Um, and this was taking a day off sick, even if you had a letter from the doctor, um, even if you phoned in beforehand to say that you were um, that you were going to be sick. Um, so if you took six days off sick, you would effectively lose your job. And this was the biggest employer in this town. Um, other things, I mean, people were afraid. You, we, people were receiving disciplinaries for taking toilet breaks. The productivity targets were so um, high that workers were afraid to go to the bathroom. I mean, a survey came out of the Amazon warehouse I worked in recently, which found that 74 percent of workers there, order pickers, were afraid to use the bathrooms because um, of the productivity targets. So, again, that was a British journalist, James Bloodworth, who went undercover in an Amazon warehouse. And I want to end um, with Assemblymember Kim. Again, Time magazine's headline, The Median Amazon Employee Salary, 28,000. Jeff Bezos makes that in 10 seconds. Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. Um, but I want to end by also saying the EU has already is already considering um, an open antitrust case against Amazon. Imagine for the last two years, instead of competing and embracing every city and every state united, calling out, calling Amazon accountable, having open investigations by the Attorney General's office in every single state, investigating into their antitrust practices. That's leverage. That's real leverage. Instead of doing that, we've given them billions of dollars to come to our cities and states. Now it's, not, it's, it's still not too late, and I think we should move forward and hold Amazon accountable. We want to thank you all for being with us. Just the beginning of the discussion, uh, New York State Assembly member Ron Kim, Stacey Mitchell joining us from Portland, Maine, at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and Greg Leroy of Good Jobs First in Washington, D.C. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we go to the border. Stay with us.